and you know, i think this is the second session yes sir yeah uh, please continue uh, okay sir. okay one minute sir yeah please go ahead you okay, can continue sir. okay Good evening, dear students. Please wait one minute. I'm going to share PPT, okay? Okay, dear students, if you have any doubt regarding the subject, means you can ping me in chat box, okay? Uh, yesterday, in yesterday's class, we have completed up to four units. We have covered some of the topics in fourth unit. Okay, today we are going to start the first topic is materials handling systems. So what is this material handling systems? Generally material handling systems are the methods that which are used to move or store or manage some materials within the organizations. Okay, because automatically it will help to improve the efficiency of operations. And it will make more materials are handled safely or not. So what is materials management means? It is a method. It's a equipment that is used to move, store or to manage the materials in the facilities. In these materials handling systems, there are some types of materials handling systems are there. Coming to the first one, you can see it in PPT, which is equipment oriented systems. In these what is these equipment oriented systems means? There are some of the examples are there. First one is conveyors, cranes, forklifts and automated guided vehicles. All these will be comes under equipment oriented systems. Okay. In these equipment oriented systems, it will be used to machines to move the materials more efficiently and automatically it will be reduce the Manual labor. Wait a second.
okay dear students so equipment oriented systems are the machines we we'll use machines to move the materials more efficiently and reduce the manual labor automatically it will leads to the reduce of cost of labor okay so coming to the second one which is method oriented systems so some of the examples you can see in the ppt which is manual handling means using workers or some automated systems like robots all these are the better examples for method oriented systems the purpose of these method oriented systems are these can be involved in human workers means they these will be oh, can involve in human workers which is moving items or fully automated methods for greater speed and more efficiency this is nothing but method oriented systems okay next coming to the objectives of these materials handling systems are reducing costs because some streamlines the movement of materials to save the time and material is automatically reduce the cost and another objective is to improve productivity okay Imp speeding up the processes to keep production flowing more smoothly will automatically improve the productivity and the last one is enhancing of the safety and some of the factors uh, should be considered in these material handling systems the first one is material type you can see it in the ppt so what is this material type means using different types of materials for example like liquids heavy parts and uh, uh, some fragile items all these are needs we have that much of need to use different handling systems this is nothing but material types and coming to the movement parts so the routes that materials take within the facility is the system should support more efficient parts to minimize time and the effort is nothing but movement parts and the last one is equipment so choosing the right tools or machines to handle the specific materials more effectively within the organization is nothing but the equipment generally the whole summary for these materials handling systems is it can be equipped equipment oriented and also like uh, conveyors and cranes or some method oriented like manual or automated robots their main objectives are to lower cost and boost productivity and improve safety when planning a materials handling systems these will be considered the type of materials that which uh, type of materials are being used or some movement of parts and appropriate equipment to ensure the more smooth and efficient operations okay hope you clear with this topic i am going to next one one second please the next one is material handling equipment so what is this material handling equipments here oh both are the same okay categories like conveyors cranes industrial trucks and uh, auxiliary equipment all these are material equipment say for conveyors we can take what are they because machines use it to move materials along a set of path is nothing but usage of the conveyors for example belt conveyors or roller conveyors also the best example for these categories so using of these conveyors is more ideal for moving items continuously like some packages on like assembly line all these are all these functions are used by the conveyors and coming to the cranes generally cranes are the machines we all are know that we all are used for lifting and moving heavy items more vertically or horizontally example zip cranes and overhead cranes so the main use of these cranes is 
perfect for moving heavy items like uh, over short distances like lifting machinery within the factory cranes will be used like this and coming to next one which is industrial trucks generally the industrial trucks are the vehicles which is used for transporting materials within a facility for example forklifts and pallet trucks these all are the industrial trucks like uh, good for moving items that don't have a fixed path allowing for flexible transport within warehouses or the factories are nothing but industrial trucks and last one is auxiliary equipment so what is these auxiliary equipment means like uh, additional which is additional equipment that uh, which will be helps with the handling and managing materials is nothing but auxiliary equipment like pallets bins storage racks so using the use of these uh, auxiliary equipment is to support efficient storage and also movement of items is nothing but auxiliary equipment generally the material handling equipment includes conveyors like uh, belt conveyors and cranes like zip cranes industrial trucks like uh, forklifts and auxiliary equipment example pallets choosing the right type of which would be depends on how fast and efficient you need the handling to be and the cost involved okay with this we have completed our fourth unit and coming to the fifth unit which one is planning and control for mass production so what is this planning and control in the mass production the planning and control is both are two different types of categories so what is planning generally the planning is this is figuring out what needs to be made and how much of it to be made and by when so it's like creating a recipe before you start cooking a big meal you decide on how ingredients and quantities and steps to be taken right like this planning needs to be think figuring out the needs and how we it we to be made and how much of it cost like this okay and coming to the control controlling is this is making sure that plan is being followed or not if something goes wrong while we doing the dish some for example you burn the food so you adjust the cooking process or some ingredients to get back on the track in the whole cooking process like this this is nothing but controlling so this is the major difference between planning and controlling why are they more important means because they are more consistency means it will helps produce the same quality products every time and more efficiency it will automatically saves the time and money by avoiding some mistakes automatically it will leads to the customer satisfaction and there are the some key parts of controlling are there like uh, quality checks tracking production and fixing problems quality checks means making sure products meet the standards or not and uh, tracking the production means like uh, keeping an eye on how things are moving along within the factory and last one is fixing problems means quickly solving the issues that slow down production or make it too costly and simple tools use means like uh, gantt charts like visual timeliness showing when tasks needs to be done inventory management systems keeping track of how raw materials and finished product is available and also we need to make that real time monitoring using some software to track production in real time and spot problems more early this is nothing but the planning and controlling so next one is assembly lines and fabrication lines so what is this assembly lines means generally an assembly line it will consists of a sequence of stations where different components are added to a product 
step by step until the final product is completed or not this is nothing but assembly line for uh, the best example for the assembly lines is in car manufacturing an assembly line involves stations where the chassis engines and seats and some other parts are added sequentially to build the complete vehicle this is nothing but assembly lines the main purpose of this assembly line is focused on putting together various pre manufactured parts to create a finished product so this is nothing but assembly line so what is these fabrication lines generally the fabrication line will involves processes that which can be change the physical or chemical properties of the raw materials to create more component or products the better example for these fabrication lines is a metal fabrication line that may be involved in cutting or some other welding or molding of metal sheets into the car doors or some different types of panels the main purpose of it these fabrication lines is to transform a raw materials or semi finished products through some physical or chemical process okay so there are some methods are there for this balancing assembly and fabrication lines so balancing production lines it ensures more efficiency and minimizes the delays and optimizes the use of resources like adjusting machine speeds and some buffers means uh, some buffers are intermediate storage areas between different stations that allow for site delays in one part of the line without affecting the entire line is nothing but the buffers and coming to the line improvements line improvements is continuous improvement such as uh, conferring the layout and uh, adding automation or streamlining tasks can optimize the efficiency so uh, for example take ways for mba students like uh, understanding the different uh, dif difference between the assembly and fabrication lines is essential for selecting the right type of production process based on the product being manufactured and balancing these lines is a strategical operation management task like uh, it will involves in adjustments and improvements to maximize productivity minimize cost and maintain the consistent quality or not like this okay the next topic is design of an assembly line so what is this design of an assembly line means generally it will involves in the organizing tasks to ensure more smooth production production flow and some balanced workloads and minimal idle time so there are some component methods are there for this design of an assembly line first one is task division and precedence diagram means dividing the tasks into work elements Uh, the production process is broken down into similar tasks or some work elements that need to be completed at different stages these ta these tasks are designed to be completed in a set of sequences or ensuring that the first product is assembled correctly or not like that and the precedence diagram coming to precedence diagram it's a visual representation of the order in which tasks must be performed it maps out which tasks must be completed before other can start showcasing dependencies between the tasks for example if uh, a task uh, like uh, it must be done before a if task a must be done before a task b these relationship is so shown in the diagram like uh, ensuring planners understand the logical sequences of operations this is nothing but precedence diagram next one is assigning tasks to different types of stations it's nothing but balancing workload means tasks are assigned to various stations along the line in a way that distributes the workload as evenly as possible because the main aim is to balance the time each station takes to complete its assigned tasks 
making sure that one station does not slow down the whole line is nothing but balancing workload and minimizing the ideal time. So what is this minimizing the ideal time means generally the ideal time refers to periods when your workstation is not actively working reducing ideal time increases automatically efficiency and more productivity. So effective line design that uh, workers or machines have consistent tasks and avoiding the unnecessary delays between the stations is nothing but these minimizing the ideal time okay next last one is line balancing method generally to optimize the design and balance of an assembly line is several methods can be employed like uh, kill bridge and western method so what is this kill bridge and western method means generally a systematic approach it will sequence tasks by considering their residence and assigning them to workstations based on their cycle time like uh, the maximum time each station can take and uh, Helgeson's and Birney method what is this Helgeson and Birney method means this is also known as the ranked positional weighted method also so these techniques generally uses to assign the tasks to workstations based on the positional weights like uh, which are determined by adding the time of each task and all subsequent uh, dependent tasks for example the goal the main goal is to ensure that tasks with the highest total time like including dependencies are prioritized to balance the line effectively and reduce uh, bottlenecks is nothing but this Helgeson and Birney method. So the main key considerations in assembly line is assembly line design is to cycle time and workstation load and efficiency. Uh, the better example here is imagine a smartphone assembly line. For example, a precedence diagram might show that installing the screen must happen before adding the battery and adding the battery must be done before securing the back panel isn't it so using line balancing methods like planners can assign these tasks to different stations to ensure a steady fall flow of that each worker or automated machines has been balanced workload or not this is the best example for this design of an assembly line okay next one is line balancing methods so what is this line balancing methods means the first one is kill bridge and western method as we discussed just before here some steps are there in this kill bridge and western method first one is to construct the residence diagram Roy diagram that which will be shows the sequence of tasks it will helps to understand the which tasks must be completed before others can start okay and step two is to assign operations to workstations based on some cycle time uh, for example distribute tasks to different types of stations making sure that the total time each station takes does not go over the cycle time the time limit for each station is to complete its work. And coming to another theory, which is Helgeson and Birney method. Here, the first step is to rank elements by positional weight. For example, you need to calculate the positional weight of each task. This is the time for the task and itself, it's a plus the time for all tasks that will depend on it. So that coming to step two, which is assign highest weight tasks first. For example, like you need to start by assigning this task with the highest potent positional weight to the first workstations. Then move on to the ne next work, which will be highest and so on. You need to continue the process. It will help to that the most important tasks are done early and balance in the workload across the stations. So, these both methods are 
help organize work on an assembly line to make sure that tasks are spread eventually across workstations or not. Coming to the automation and robotics. So what is this auto, uh, automation and robotics means? Generally, automation is the use of technology to perform the tasks with minimal human intervention. Okay, It generally brings together machine tools and some system for moving materials and also some control systems. For example, computers or sensors to create a seamless production process. Uh, you take a better example in a car factory, automation includes machines that uh, weld car parts together or paint car bodies without human workers. Without need of the human workers, they will do it manually. Okay. So this is nothing but automation. So what are the industrial robots? What are industrial robots means? Generally, industrial robots are the programmable machines that can be performs a variety of tasks unlike uh, like uh, fixed machines that only do one thing robots can be reprogrammed to do different types of tasks for example a robot arm in a manufacturing plant can pick up for car parts and also some place into an assembly line if it's needed okay uh, it can be reprogrammed to screw bolts or some other more different parts this is nothing but industrial robots next one is benefits of these automations and robots but the first one is increased productivity generally the machines and robots can work faster and longer period without the breakdowns by also increasing the number of products made in less time right isn't it so automatically it will increases the productivity for example you can take a factory Factory with robots can run 24 by 7, producing more items compared to the factory with manual workers who need rest. Okay. And also the second one is to improving safety. Generally, robots can handle dangerous tasks also by reducing the risk of injury to workers. For example, in you can take a chemical plants. In chemical plants, robots can work with hazardous materials, protecting the human workers from more exposure. So it's a improving, improved safety. Okay. Later, consistency and quality. Of course, definitely a automation ensures that every product is made with the same precision and the quality. It will reduce the errors. For example, in food processing, Automatical machines also. Uh, nowadays, we can see automated machines also. It can fill the bottles with exact amount of uh, food or some ensuring consistency in every each unit, right? This is nothing but consistency and quality. And uh, coming to the sixth unit, which is planning and control for batch production. So we have discussed about mass production right now. Next, batch production. Generally, what is this batch production means? It's a method where products are made in a groups or some batches instead of a continuous flow. It is nothing but batch production. So once one batch is completed, then the production line is set up for the another next batch. So which may be a different product or different types of variants. For example, a bakery, a bakery making a batch of chocolate muffins. Okay. Immediately right after it will followed by a batch of blueberry muffins. So after one batch finishes, the equipment is cleaned or reset for the next flavor. This is nothing but batch process. So the planning in these batch process production is demand forecasting and scheduling resource allocation all these are the main planning in batch production
and controlling in batch production is like uh, quality controls so each batch each batch needs some quality checks to ensure that it meets standards or not like that if any de defect is found then that batch may be need to adjust rather than the entire production line like that and monitoring the progress and adjusting the variability and also some benefits of planning and control in batch production is it's it is more flexibility because it's a easier task to switch between products or make adjustments to batch to batch as if it is needed and also cost man management because by producing in batches companies can manage costs more better by producing only what's needed rather than the maintaining continuous production and also we can reduce more wastages you can take a better example in one factory it is producing a different types of furnitures like uh, uh, automatically it will planning helps to determine how how many chairs and tables and some shelves should be made in a each batch based on the customer orders right so controlling controlling that uh, that could be ensured that each batch meets its quality standards and it is completed on time before the switching to the next batch this is the best example for this batch production okay So determining the optimal batch size. So how could you determine the optimal batch size means finding the optimal batch size means generally it is deciding how much to produce in each batch to minimize cost and maximize efficiently. So in batch pro, uh, in batch size in determining the optimal batch size balancing cost means set up in a cost so every time a new batch starts there are the cost associated with setting up the different types of equipment or some ch changing configurations configurations and uh, the more batches you produce the higher the total setup will be cost right next inventory holding cost the inventory holding cost is when the batches are large whenever we are uh, Preparing to batches, if the batch is more large, you will have more products in storage, which cost money and some storage space and a risk of a spoilage of the products and like uh, etc. The goal is to find a batch size that minimizes both setup and holding cost. And second one is, you, as you can see in PPT, formula and optimization. So in the formula and optimization, total cost formula means it is a formula that combines setup and holding cost to calculate the total cost for different batch sizes. By using the mathematical optimization, so you can find the batch size that speaks total cost the lowest. The better example is if uh, a smaller batch increases the setup cost but reduces the holding cost or if larger ba batches do the opposite optimization helps find the balances that minimizes overall expenses right and coming to last but not least single and multi products model here single product model means this model generally calculates the optimal batch size for just one product or making it simpler to balance the costs and coming to multi product models here when producing the multiple products each with a different setup and holding cost the model will becomes more complex optimization helps decide the best batch size for each product to minimize the total cost across all the products so the better example here is in a bakery producing a large batch of bread will be reduces the setup costs like uh, fewer starts and stops 
but uh, automatically it will be increases the holding cost like uh, more space and the risk of waste uh, by using the optimization formula the bakery can uh, determine the best batch size to minimize the total cost this is nothing but the determining optimal batch size okay So the next one is aggregate production planning. So what is this aggregate production planning needs? One second. So, aggregate production plan. Generally, aggregate production planning, we can say also APP. It is a process of creating a plan for the overall production of goods over a medium term period, like usually a 6 to 18 months. Okay. It involves deciding on workforce and machine allocations to meet the demand while minimizing the different types of costs. There are some key elements are there for this aggregate production planning like uh, like uh, workforce and machine allocation means generally the APP determines how many workers and machines are needed at each period. These planning will ensure the right resources are available to meet the production goals. Without overstaffing or underutilizing the equipment is nothing but workforce and machine allocation plans and uh, balancing costs. What is this balancing cost means? Generally, inventory and holding cost. These are the cost of storing finished goods. If more products are made, then needed to holding the cost increases. So and also adjustment cost generally we all know that adjustment cost occurs when production levels need to be changed for example hiring or laying of workers over time pay okay over time pay generally and adjusting machines usage usage all add to adjustment costs like app price price to balance these costs to keep production smooth and cost effective. Next one is master schedule creation. So uh, generally ABP will result in a master production schedule. It is a plan that outlines what will be produced when and uh, in what quantities it needs to be produced. This schedule guides the production process and helps ensure that the production meets demand consistently or not like this uh, the best example for uh, this is a car a toy manufacturer you can take a to toy manufacturer they might be use aggregate production aggregate production planning to prepare for peak seasons like uh, in holiday seasons by planning extra shifts and hiring temporary workers and adjusting the machine usage these ensures they have enough toys ready without accessing storage cost or last minute changes. This is the best example. Really, it's, it was the best example for aggregate production planning. Okay. Next is material requirements planning. MRP. We all know that. You can see it is MRP. So generally the material requirements planning is a system. It is used to that uh, when materials and components are available when it is needed in the production process. It is also a, it, it will also schedule the material needs over time to keep the production more smoothly. So there are some key components of these MRPs like uh, 
टाइम पेजड प्लानिंग फॉर मेटीरियल रिक्वायरमेंट्स मींस एमआरपी विल शेड्यूल्स व्हेन मटेरियल्स आर रिक्वायर्ड एट ईच स्टेज ऑफ प्रोडक्शन इट कंसीडर्स दैट सर लीड टाइम हाउ लॉन्ग इट टेक्स टू गेट मटेरियल सो दैट पार्ट्स विल अरेव जस्ट इन टाइम फॉर यूज अवॉइडिंग द डिलेस ऑफ एनी सम एक्सेसिव इन्वेंटरी ओके बिल्स ऑफ मटेरियल्स BOM or routing sheets and inventory data. So what is this uh, BOM means? This is a list of all parts and materials. Uh, which type of materials and uh, the list of materials that is needed to make a product like a recipe. And the routing sheets. What, uh, what does these routing sheets mean? This will generally outline the steps into a production process. Like uh, it will be helping the MRP determine when materials are needed at each stage. Next, inventory data. Here, uh, current inventory levels are being tracked. Like uh, so, automatically MRP knows what's already available and what needs to be ordered for the next process. So, minimizing work in process inventory. Like uh, MRP will reduce the most of unfinished goods setting around by scheduling materials to arrive exactly when they are needed. This keeps the work in progress inventory low and saving space and reducing the storage cost. Here, uh, for example, imagine a furniture company. Generally, the furniture company that makes tables MRP helps by creating a schedule for when wood screws and varnish need to be arrived based on the production timeline. Using the BOM and MRP, they will know exactly how much of each item is required. These way parts are arrived just in time, minimizing the space and cost of storing extra materials. This is nothing but MRPs, okay? And the next topic is line of balance, LOV, for monitoring. So what is this line of balance means? It's a graphical tool. Okay, it is a graphical tool. And uh, moreover, it helps in monitoring and coordinating the demand for resources in production. It tracks whether uh, production is on, is, is on scheduled time or not and uh, also it will be helps in identifying any delays or shortage earlies. It is nothing but line of balances. So how, how this LOB will work? Generally, coordination and demand on resources. Means LOB shows how resources like uh, materials, labor, equipment, how these are being used in production when compared to the planet schedule and also it will help to managers that resources are available when if needed okay next progress tracking generally the elbow the elbow we will track the progress elbow we displays the progress visually making it more easy to see if production stages are on track or not or falling behind Next one is identification of shortages or delays by comparing actual production against the plan. LOB will more quickly highlight any areas where resources are lacking or production is delayed. So where is this LOB is useful? So generally LOB is especially helpful in batch manufacturing. Where complex products like boilers or aircrafts are made in stages. These types of products involve many components and assembly steps. So keeping track of resources needs and potential is essential. For example, uh, you can take a aircraft manufacturing plant. Here, a lobby can show if parts, party like a uh, Parts like engines or wings or some avail available on within the schedule time or not. If any delay is occurred in one part of the assembly process, LOB helps here to pinpoint the issue 
allowing the managers to make adjustments if necessary to get back on the track. So the line of balance is, is a visual tool for tracking the production progress and also resources used. It helps ensure that production meets the planned schedule by identifying different shortages or more delays, making it especially value for batch and manufacturing of complex different types of products. Okay. So another one is Kanban and flexible manufacturing systems, FMS. So what is this Kanban system? Generally, the Kanban is a production method. It will help to reduce the waiting time, means lead time. L-E-A-D, lead, lead time, okay. And the amount of inventory being worked on in process inventory. Okay, how carbon, uh, sorry, Kanban works. Generally, these uh, Kanban will use us as a signals to manage the production. When a workstation needs more parts or materials, means it sends a Kanban card to the previous stations to request only the necessary amount and keeping production flow efficient and avoiding the excess inventory. So benefits of Kanban, coming to the benefits of Kanban, the decentralization control. So each station will control its own supply needs, making the system more flexible and responsive to the changes. And also less waste is like uh, by only producing what's needed, Kanban will help in minimizing the waste and keep inventory levels low. Uh, the best example he here is, Take a car factory. When a worker on the assembly line runs low on wheels, then uh, they will send a Kanban card to the parts. Here, department which only supplies as many wheels as are needed for the next steps, preventing the overstock. Okay. Next is flexible manufacturing systems, FMS. So FMS is a manufacturing system generally. It is where production is controlled by the central computer. This setup allows for the flexible and efficient production of different products or product variants without major delays. Okay. So how FMS works? It is in central computer managers with different machines like tools and some resources in the factories. It can quickly change production plans and adjust mission settings, allowing the factory to produce a variety of products on the demand. The, the benefits of these FMS are like flexibility, efficiency. For example, you take a electronic manufacturing. Here, FMS can quickly switch from producing one model of a smartphone to the another, adjusting machines and setting with minimal downtime. So the Kanban cards are used to signal the production needs and making it a flexible and reducing the wastage method with decentralized control. So FMS is a computer control system that allows flexible and efficient production of multiple products by easily adapting machines and schedules. So together the Kanban and FMS helps improve more production efficiently and responsiveness automatically and the flexibility will be occurred in manufacturing environments. Okay. Uh, coming to the seventh unit, which is planning and control for job shop production. Here, what is job shop production? Generally, the job shop production is a manufacturing setup where products are custom made in small quantities. Each product or batch has unique specifications like uh, requiring flexible planning and uh, it will 
for take a example of a workshop that makes custom furniture or specialized machine parts where each order has different types of requirement isn't it so planning in job shop production means routing and scheduling so what are these routing means determines the sequence of operations for each job as each product may need different processes and machines and it will also schedule the plans and each job should start and finish to avoid the machine overloads and meet deadlines for example take a custom table here routing may include cutting and sanding and assembly and finishing in in a specific order with scheduling to ensure each step is to be completed within time or not. Okay. Here we let us know some challenges in job shop scheduling. Okay. Here, job shop scheduling is generally a complex due to the unique requirements of each job and the variety of tasks to be involved. Here, some challenges which is facing by these job shop schedules is complex weighing system. So, what is this complex weighing system? Means in a job shop, different jobs often need different types of machines or some processes in various orders, creating a complex flow of tasks. For example, one custom order might require steps of A, B and C, while another needs B, D and E. So, coordinating these verifying parts is a main challenge. This is nothing but complex weighing systems. Second challenge is waiting times. So, with multiple jobs, waiting for the same machines. So, some jobs end up waiting their turn, which can slow down the production and delay completion times. Example, if two jobs need the same cutting machine, one may have to wait, isn't it? So, increasing its overall production time. This is also a another challenge. Waiting times is also a another challenge in job shop scheduling. Next one is in process inventories. Means when jobs are delayed at set time stages, partially completed items build up. So, increasing in process inventory, these tie up the space and resources and it can be increased cost. For example, there is a several jobs are waiting for the assembly. They occupy space and resources until they can continue. So, which can add to handling the cost. The next challenge is machine idle times. So, when machines are waiting for jobs to arrive, means like uh, due to some delays in previous steps, they sit idle. Reducing the overall efficiency and productivity. Example, if the painting machine is ready, but the part has not been finished assembly. So, the machine stays idle. Simply, it can't, it will won't do anything. It's a wasting of time, no. So, this is also a another challenge in job shop design. Machine idle types, okay. So, generally, job shop scheduling will face these types of challenges like coordinating varied task routes and managing the waiting time and in-process inventory and reducing the ideal times. These issues are require careful planning and real-time adjustments to keep production efficient and minimize delays and some other costs. Okay. With this, we have finished this topic. If you have any doubts regarding the topics, means you can ask. Okay. You can ping me in chat box. So next one is N jobs on one machine. 
so uh, in situations where multiple jobs means n jobs need to be processed on a single machine it will be effective sequencing helps manage production flow like a sequencing rules means shortest processing time like uh, spt this is a common rule where jobs are scheduled based on their processing times with the shortest job going first why spt generally this spt is used because its efficiency organizes job to reduce the delays and keep the production line moving smoothly benefits of spt in a single machine case is minimizes the mean flow time means the average time a job spends in the system like from starting to the ending start to the from start time to the finish time it is to be reduced helping jobs move through more faster and minimum reduces the mean waiting time means by track, uh, tackling the shortest uh, jobs first and spt will minimize the time other jobs and spend waiting and improving overall efficiency and it's also decreases the mean lateness means spt will helps to reduce the how late jobs are relative to the due dates helping to meet their delivery timeliness for example imagine a single machine that needs to process three jobs with the processing times of 2 5 and 3 hours okay using spt the job with 2 hours is done first then 3 hours and lastly 5 hours this sequencing keeps the system efficient and reduces the waiting time for the jobs and automatically it will be ensures the machine is not idle longer than necessary so for scheduling the multiple jobs on the one time sequencing by shortest processing time spt is highly effective it minimizes the time job spent in systems and reducing wait waiting time and also decreases the lateness and making it a preferred rule for single machine job schedule okay So next one is weighted shortest processing time. Here, weighted shortest processing time, WSPT. It is a scheduling method that extends the shortest processing time rule by assigning weights to the jobs. These weights represent the important or priority of each job. The purpose of these uh, WSPT is. this approach will helps to prioritize jobs that are more more important if uh, even if they have longer processing times ensuring that higher prioritizing jobs receive attention sooner okay how this uh, wspt will be works means weights assigned to jobs here each job is given a weight based on its importance higher weights means a job is more critical to the production goals and scheduling formula here wspt uses a formula to calculate a weighted mean flow time which takes into account both the processing time and the weight of each job jobs with a high weights and shorter processing time are given more priority okay so there are some benefits of these uh, weighted shortest processing time is optimizing weighted mean flow time so by factoring in weights and uh, uh, minimizes the average time weighted by the job importance it will be which can help in meet specific production goals such as focusing on high value orders here yeah. 
the best example for these WSBT is consider a machine which is processing two jobs. Job A with a processing time of three hours and a high weight means priority and job B with a processing time of two hours but a lower weight which is using WSPT job A would be prioritized because it's important weight it will the weight will justify its being processed first despite its very longer processing time okay this is nothing but weight at shortest processing time WSPT So next one is earliest due date rule, EDD. What is this earliest due date means? It is a scheduling method where jobs are organized in the order of their due dates. It is job that has the earlier due date being processed first. The purpose of this EDD is use it to ensure that jobs with closer deadlines are prioritized, helping creep production in scheduling time. There are set benefits are there for this EDD rule. First one is minimizing, minimize, it will minimize the maximum job lateness. Means by focusing on due dates and EDD will help reduce the risk of jobs being completed late. It does not guarantee every job will be on time, but it minimizes the longest delay, which is especially useful when uh, the deadlines are critical and it is also a very simple and effective. Uh, you can take a better example that uh, imagine, just imagine a machine has three jobs to process with due dates of job A, which is the first due date is in two days and coming to the job B, the, first, the next due date in the five days and coming to job C. Due date in three days. Using the EDD rule, the machine will process the job A first, followed by the job C, later and finally job B. The sequence ensures that jobs are completed as close to their deadliness as possible, minimizing the latest completion time. So, the earliest due date. So, the EDD rule schedules jobs in the orders of their due dates helping to reduce maximum lateness across all jobs. This rule is ideal for environments where meeting due dates is essential to maintaining the customer satisfaction and operations efficiently. Okay. With this we have completed earliest due date rule also. EDD also we have finished it. And next one is um, just wait for one minute. So here the main important topic is priority dispatching rules. So what is this priority dispatching rules means? It's a priority dispatching rules. These are the methods for deciding the order in which job should be processed. Based on different criteria, here are some common rules are there like uh, which will include like uh, FCFS means first come and first serve. Mainly here jobs are processed in the order they arrive without considering any other factors. It is a very simple and fair as jobs are handled in the order they were received and they may be the most efficient in terms of time, especially if a long job arrives before shorter ones. Coming to the SPST, just we are discussed the shortest processing time. Mm -hmm. Here jobs with the shortest processing time are prioritized and completed first. The main advantage here is to 
minimize the average waiting time and keeps the jobs moving very quickly and coming to disadvantage it can lead to longer jobs waiting for extended periods which may delay them significantly and coming to the uh, third one edd earliest due dates it means here the jobs will be prioritized based on their due dates with the job having the earliest due date processed first the main advantage in edd is it will helps minimizing the maximum lateness of the jobs and it is ideal when meeting due dates is critical the disadvantage here is it may not minimizes the total processing time or waiting time for other jobs and next one is slack means minimum slack time um, the slack time in the is the time left until a job due dates minus its processing time jobs with the least slack time that is the tightest deadline are given priority okay here the main advantage is useful for it will be useful for ensuring the jobs are completed just in time for their due dates and preventing the delays okay and the main disadvantages in slack is it will requires a precise calculations and may shift priorities frequency as slack time will be changes so these priority will dispatching rules helps will decide the main sequence of job processing the coming to overall fc fs is for simplicity and fairness and spt is for reducing the overall waiting time and edd is for meeting due dates effectively and slack is for jobs with tight deadline ensuring they are done on time or not so here each rule serves different types of production goals and it can be chosen based on the specific needs and the workflow of the organization okay and coming to the eighth unit which is planning and controlling of the projects so generally in project management planning and control are two foundational components that guide a project from inception and to completion of it so coming to the project plan generally the project plan will think of planning as creating the road maps for the project it's about setting clear goals and uh, defining tasks and allocating the resources more effectively the main key steps in planning is we all are know that first one is to defining the objectives like uh, outline what the projects aim to be achieved and we needs to clear objectives provide a target for all stakeholders or not like that. and second one is to scope definition clearing the identify what includes and what nots later resource allocation assigning the people equipment or some budgets where they are needed most all these are the resource allocations next risk management it's a last step in the planning process and coming to the project controls what is project control is generally project control is all about the ensuring the project stays on course or meaning that the project is on track to meet its objectives within budget and on time okay uh, key aspects of uh, project control is like monitoring progress means regularly checking the status of tasks or some other resources and overall project timeliness this is many managers use tools like uh, uh, gantt charts or some dashboards to visualize the project progress and performance management this will involve setting metrics and benchmarks to measure progress against and also variance analysis it will identify the difference between the plan and actual results okay coming to corrective actions all these are based on various analysis and adjust resources and some timeliness or some even project scope as needed to get back on the track okay
and the main link between these uh, planning and control is planning sets the direction while controlling keeps the project aligned with the with that direction effective control and release on the strong well thought and uh, generally you, you take a practical example like imagine you are leading a project to launch a new product okay here during planning you outline milestones like project design and some prototyping and market testing as you move on to the control phase you monitor each milestones if uh, prototyping takes longer than planned you may adjust the timeliness or relocate resources to make up the time ensuring the project still meets its final day deadline or not like that okay So CPMs means critical path methods. So what is these uh, CPMs means? Generally, it is a project management tool, which is used to plan and schedule and control tasks more effectively, especially when the duration of each activity is known with certainty. Okay. Uh, the CPM also helps in determining the minimum project duration and uh, also it will identify the critical activities that if uh, delayed would delay or uh, entire project okay uh, here uh, you can see in the PPT some step-by-step -step breakdown of CPM is the first one is to determining activity times here in cpm each activity has a known different duration which means there are no variation or uncertainty in how long each task will be take this is in contrast to methods like pert means program evaluation and review taking which deals with uncertain or probabilistic activity times so why deterministic matters because by using fixed time CPM allows for precise calculations and start and finish dates, making it useful in environmental where task durations are predicted. So computerizing the these earliest and latest start and finish times, first one is ES, means earliest starts here. The earliest time an activity can begin is based on the completion of its preceding activities. Next is EF, which means earliest finish. Here, the earliest an activity can finish calculated as ES plus the activity duration. Next, LS means latest start. The latest time an activity can start without delaying the overall project is LS. And coming to latest finish here, it's an activity can without affecting the subsequent tasks or other project lines. Generally, these times are calculated through a forward pass for earliest times and the backward pass for latest times through the network diagram. So... You take an example like uh, imagine you are managing a project to build a small commercial building. Activities include like foundation, framing, plumbing, electrical roofing and finishing. Okay. Let's say the framing must be done before plumbing and electrical can start and both plumbing and electrical must be completed before roofing. Isn't it? So you would map out these activities and calculate earliest and latest start finish times 
and identifying the critical path. If framing and plumbing and roofing fall on the same critical paths, any delays here will extend the entire project timeline. So non-critical tasks is like uh, landscaping with does not need to be completed until the very end. Might have some slack uh, giving you more flexibility. So CPM is valuable because it provides a clear timeliness and identifies which activities are most sensitive to delays and helps in resources allocation by focusing on critical tasks. So we have finished the critical path method. Next important method is PART, which is program evaluation and um, review technique okay one minute here program evaluation and review technique is a project management tool it is designed for projects where activity durations are uncertain Unlike the critical part method is which is really on deterministic means fixed times, but the part incorporates variability. It's making it useful for complex projects with high uncertainty. So handling uncertain activity times means that is used when there are uncertainty in how long each task will take. This is common in research or uh, development or any innovative projects where time estimates are not allowed resize. Instead of a single fixed duration for each task, PERT uses three different estimations to account for variability. Three time estimates are, first one is optimistic means O. The minimum possible time, if everything goes smoothly, this is the best case scenario is optimistic. So next one is M, which is most likely, the most probable duration based on the past experiences and usual conditions. Next one is P, pessimistic. So the pessimistic means it's the maximum possible time. If things go wrong, this is the Worst case scenario, okay. These three estimates allow SPERT to account for different scenarios and create a more flexible project plan. Next, expected time and variance calculation. Here, expected time means TE, which is PERT calculates a weighted average to determine the likely duration for each activity using the formula. Uh, here some different types of formulas are there that is uh, T is equals to O plus 4M plus P by 6 is the T is formula and coming to va variance, variance is equals to P minus 0 by 6 whole square okay. Mm. With this, we have finished the part, okay? Next one is capacity planning. So what is this capacity planning means? Generally, it is a strategy process in operations management. It is used to determine the production capacity, which is required by an organization to meet changing demands for its products or their services. It's very crucial 
for ensuring that the company can satisfy customer demand without incurring unnecessary cost from overproduction or lost sales from underproduction. Here, we can see predicting future capacity requirements. So, what is predicting future capacity requirements? It says it's more essential for businesses to align their resources with anticipated demand and ensuring whether they can meet the customer needs without incurring unnecessary cost. Various forecasting methods will help businesses anticipate capacity needs, particularly for mature outputs like establishing products and uh, services with a predictable demand patterns and new products with unset time demands. Here, methods for uh, predicting capacity for uh, mature outputs are regression analysis. So, what is this regression analysis means? It is a statistical method which is identifying relationship between variable you might analyze the past sales data or some identifying factors like seasonality and economic conditions or some marketing spend to predict the future demand this is nothing but uh, one of the statistical method in regression analysis by creating a mathematical model regression analysis will helps to predict how changes in one factor like example uh, you take a advertising spend it could impact the capacity requirements right next uh, econometric forecasting so what is this econometric forecasting means it's a model that combine both economic theories with statistical techniques to predict the demands based on the broader economic indicators example inflation gdp growth and the interest rate all these are the economic forecasting these approaches beneficial when demand is influ influenced by economic trends as it is incorporated various external factors into the predictions so Next one is Delphi method. So what is this Delphi method? It is a structural way to gather insights from experts through some multiple rounds of surveys or some questionnaires. After each round, it, it will results are shared with the different type, their group and uh, they will be experts adjusting their responses based on the feedback and leading to the consensus okay this is particularly useful when historical data is limited and expert opinions are needed if uh, to predict future demand and the next one is market surveys we all are know the market surveys here they will gather the data directly from the customers about their future purchasing and uh, some intentional or preferences these direct input can provide reliable insights into the demand for uh, establishing the products or some especially when they are potential for the shift in a consumer trends so surveys can be conducted regularly to detect changes in customer preferences and adjust the capacity plans accordingly okay and the next one is life cycle analysis for new products or answer time demand what does it mean means generally it will dealing with new products or products with unset time demand. Traditional forecasting methods may be less effective because they are limited time or no historical data. Uh, for example, life cycle analysis. As in yesterday's class, we have discussed the, uh, it considers that the products typically go through the different types of stages like uh, introduction stages, uh, maturity growth stage and maturity stage and last one is decline stage okay this is nothing but predicting future capacity requirements
So our next topic is just wait. Next important topic is risk analysis in capacity plan. So what is this risk analysis in capacity planning means it's a planning that helps in businesses to identifying and manage the potential risks which is associated with over or under investing in capacity. It will be making the wrong capacity decisions that can have significant consequences on different types of cost. The first one here is over capacity means Generally, the overcapacity will happen when a business has more production capacity than the needed. Okay. It, this means it has too much equipment or some too much space or workforce related to demand. Here, coming to the risk, having too much capacity leads to higher fixed cost because the company has to pay for facilities like uh, equipment and labor uh, regardless of how much it's producing these fixed cost eats to e into the different profits when they are not outset by sales you can take a best example of imagine a, um, a car manufacturer will say new factory uh, they are expecting high demand for a new model however demand falls short and expectations also and now the factory is underused, okay. So the fa the company still has to pay for facility upkeep and uh, some staff and some utilities, leading to the high fixed cost and reducing profitability. And coming to the under capacity. So what is this under capacity means? Under capacity occurs when a business does not have enough resources to meet the demands. It lacks the production capacity to satisfy the customer needs fully. So here the risk is this leads to lost sales and missed opportunities. As customers may turn to competitors who can meet their needs on within time. Example, suppose you take a bakery that has only one oven and demand for its pastries doubles. Without enough oven space, the bakery can't bake fast enough to meet their demand, isn't it? So, leading to stockouts, customers may go to the competitor's bakery instead. Automatically, it will result in lost sales and the potential loss of the customer loyalty. This is nothing but the under capacity. And the next one is, next risk analysis is strategic impacts on competitive means capacity planning impacts a company's ability to compete efficiency if a company has too much or too little capacity it can't affect the customer satisfaction pricing or some market positions take a best example let's say two two tech companies company a and company b are competing Company A has enough capacity to quickly meet raising their demand for its new gadgets, giving it an advantage in terms of market share and some customer satisfaction. However, in company B, struggles with under capacity, leading to delays and some back orders. So, customers start to favor company A, improving its competitive position, while company B is risk losing market relevance. Okay, so analyzing these risks allow companies to make informed capacity decisions that supports sustainable growth and competitive strength. These balance is very crucial in markets where demand can fluctuate and customer expectations are more high. Okay. And uh, with these, I am closing the session. Tomorrow we will continue from the unit 10 onwards. Okay. Thank you.